It is uh, my privilege to reintroduce uh, to the church. I know I asked this morning how many of you have not heard Pastor Monty preach, and there was a handful of you that had yet to hear him. And so for your sake, I give you a few fun facts about Pastor Monty. Uh, he is the longtime pastor of Faith Baptist Church, used to be in Avon, now in Danville, uh, Indiana. They uh, had a, a beautiful property. Britt and I got married in that property 20 three, 24 years ago uh, there in Avon and then relocated. The Lord's grown their ministry so much. They went into a building project and they relocated into Danville, uh, Indiana. And I know there's several Hoosiers in the house. You used to live in the Hoosier state and you've transplanted down here to Pensacola. How many of you are Hoosiers like Dr. Monty? Would you raise your hand? Good. So you're among friends, of course, Pastor Monty. And, um, and so uh, uh, more importantly, maybe as far as the significance of my relationship with him, not, not only is he the pastor of Faith Baptist, but he is my foster father. And he took me in uh, when I was 15 years old. And uh, it's no exaggeration to say at least at least the way I feel in my heart, is that he loved me when I was extremely unlovable and uh, full of drama and a lot of, uh, and he's giggling back there, I can hear it because he's probably thinking of specific things, but just very kind to me. He and his wife, Kelly, uh, showed me love when I definitely didn't deserve it. They were gracious people, and, uh, and so I love him very much. Pastor Monty's in town this week. I think he's teaching at the seminary, uh, Pensacola Theological Seminary, and so when I heard he was going to be in town, I wanted to Uh, give him an opportunity again to address the people here of North Stone Baptist Church. So if you have not as of yet, ask the Lord to speak to you through the preaching of the Word of God. I hope you'll do that. Okay, Pastor Monty, would you come at this time? Thank you so much, Pastor Johnson. I love coming to this church because it is a place that I absolutely feel at home from the many times Pastor Johnson has invited me to come speak to getting to know all of you, and that, that's special to me. I love people, I love having relationships, and genuinely knowing people, and so I just love coming here. Now, I, I also know this. Um, the, um, the message this morning was out of Psalm 77, and Pastor Johnson informed me of that. I want to let you know, first of all, that I chose that text way before he even thought of it, okay? <laughs> Okay, he, uh, he chose that text around 7 o'clock this morning, and, uh, and I, had, uh, I had chosen it uh, earlier. I also want to mention this, that, um, that you, what you got this morning was the meat and potatoes. That's the real meat. You got the exegetical, in-depth, theological view. You got the meal. You got the meat and potatoes. Tonight, folks, it's all ice cream, okay? So... We'll, we'll be in the same passage. You know, I, have, I love being here, and I love seeing people and getting to meet people, getting to, know, getting to know all of you a lot better. So we will look at Psalm 77. Uh, you don't have to stand or anything. You did that this morning. We'll look at Psalm 77 in just a moment. But um, I, I'm just so glad for an opportunity to speak. I, I want to say I'm so proud of, of your pastor and his wife. I'm, I, I cannot think of a young man and his wife. You'll always be young to me, Pastor Johnson. Britain, you'll be eternally young. You know that, right? Okay, you're welcome. You can pay me later. But uh, uh, I don't know of a young man and his wife that I'm more proud of and more pleased with what the Lord has done with him and in his life. And you know what I love to watch? I, I think he's an excellent preacher. I really do. I think he's an excellent preacher. And I, all those videos, you know, do you all watch those videos? Those short little videos that are kind of herky-jerky? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> kind of, I, I'm, I'm 56 years old. That's a little bit uh, too much action for me on those videos, okay? I get, it makes me nervous. It gives me anxiety. And, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, he does all those things. But the thing I love the best is watching him love you and watching him relate to you, and watching him be a pastor. Because being a pastor is not an ivory tower experience. It's all about, Pastor Monty, you know, your main job is to just sit in your study and, and memorize the Greek New Testament. I'm sorry, that's not my main job. My main job is to be in and among the sheep, loving them and shepherding them. That is fundamentally the job of a pastor. And I watch your pastor do an excellent job of that, and so I'm very thankful for that. And I come down here, of course, to speak at the seminary for a week. I would covet your prayers in regard to that, but then uh, also because of the week and how it fell, I had, and it isn't it great when something happy, happy happens in your life? Isn't that awesome? Now, back in, in March, we celebrated at our church, my wife and I celebrated 
25 years at Faith Baptist Church, 25 years, and, uh, and that was a special time. In fact, I think there's a slide for that. Mash the button back there, guys. There's a slide. So there's a picture. That was on that Sunday <coughs> back in March. Yeah, he really was doing something important. He was preaching for me. He wasn't just out gallivanting. And uh, that's a picture of myself in our auditorium with your pastor. And then on the other side is my other foster son, Benny. We have three foster sons. And uh, we, got, we got that picture. That was a really, really special time. I come down here today uh, for speaking at the seminary. But this week is super special because it's exciting Last night, I got to go to the sports banquet. Now, um, Andrew, what did you win at the sports banquet? Just stand up, please, Andrew, if you would, please. Um, I got MVP for basketball. Most valuable player for basketball. Uh, yeah, second in track. And second in track. That's awesome. Give him a round of applause. That, that's a real accomplishment. Now, uh, Matthew, why don't you stand up and explain what you got? Most improved player. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when you came on the team, you stunk. And then by, okay, okay. I understood. But, but it's, it was so happy. It was so happy last night to be in a gymnasium at PCA filled with young people uh, who were just excited and thrilled about their genuine accomplishments and to be honored that way. And then later on, Thursday night, right, Andrew? On Thursday night, this young man's graduating from high school. And isn't that exciting? It's wonderful. So, so back in March, we, Kelly and I, we celebrate. And isn't life good? Folks, look at me for a second. Isn't life good? It's good. And when the good times come, we, just, we, we, we eat that up because it's joyous, it's exciting, it's celebration. It's, are you going to have an open house, Andrew? Yeah, you won't be I won't be here for that? <laughs> okay. So let me give you a clue about this. Be sure to serve really good food. Okay, the key to a successful open house is Mexican food, okay? It's the key. That's the key. I would say that. You know, by the way, if you're getting married, we got a lot of young people in here tonight. If, if, you're, if you're getting married and you spend $6,000 on the wedding dress and 5 bucks on the meal, that's a sin against God. Okay, you need to reverse that because married couples, when they're getting married, celebrating their wedding, what do they need to do? They need to put their guests first and honor them. Now, if you want to hear my entire philosophy of the Christian wedding, you can talk to me after the service. But all these things, weddings, graduations, all these things, anniversaries, birthdays. Well, how many like your birthday? Do you like your birthday? I know, there comes a point in time when you don't. But, but all these things, little kids love their birthdays. But all these things are times of great celebration. We, we know how to handle those things. And thank God, life has some really good things. But along with our 25th anniversary at our church in the month of March, we also had some really deep sorrow. It was at that same month, just prior to our anniversary, about a week or so before, that my mother, almost 94 years old, went home to be with the Lord. It was really sad. It was a difficult time. I think I shared with the congregation that she had had Alzheimer's. That's a picture of me walking my mom up through our, our backyard. A friend of mine, by the way, he took that picture. He didn't tell me he'd taken that picture. And he told me later, he said, I've got a picture for you. He said, I snapped this picture. I never showed it to you. And he said, I was saving it for when your mom went home to be with the Lord. And his wife had it printed and had it framed for me. It's in our home. And I love how the sunshine's kind of coming through. It's almost like we're, we're walking towards the golden stairway. And uh, it was a hard time because for a number of years, my mom had Alzheimer's. She lived with us in our home for over four years. By the end of that time period, it became impossible for her to live with us because she would fall and had a lot of physical problems. It was incredibly challenging. My wife, um, my wife is the best caregiver and strongest woman I think that I've ever known because all the ladies understand the burden of that care fell heavily, heavily upon her shoulders. And it was over those four years, it was um, like I was watching my mom slip away. You know, I don't know, I'm, probably many in this room are familiar with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. And um, you don't lose a loved one instantly like that. It's a, it's a gradual process. And you have to let go of them one piece at a time. It's very difficult because uh, the person that you knew is no longer there. 
And every once in a while, they'll have a good day, and some memory comes back, and some brightness comes back to the eyes every once in a while. And, and, uh, but that, the, those become few and far between. And then towards the end, my mom got to the point where uh, she didn't know us. She didn't know me at all. And uh, I would just bring her a box of cookies, and we had to put her in a nursing home. By the way, I hated doing that. I never wanted to do that, but we had to. There was nothing else we could do. And I, I learned an older person in my church told me, don't feel guilty. You, for four years, done your best, and it would be dangerous for her to stay in your home. We had, we had all those funny moments, you know, uh, when my mom was still up and around and able to move around. I came home and one day for lunch, and I smelled something cooking on the stove, and, and uh, she was, uh, looked like she was making something. I said, Mom, what are you making? She said, I'm making beef stew. And it just didn't smell like beef stew. It just didn't smell right. And so... Uh, I said, Mom, what is, what kind, she said, oh, that's beef stew. She said, it's delicious. And uh, I said, well, it doesn't smell right to me. So I went over to the trash can and <laughs> opened it up. And, and there, sure enough, there was the can there. It was, uh, it was dog food. It was, <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. It was, it was dog food. And, uh, and I said, Mom, I said, that's not beef stew. I said, that's dog, uh, dog food. And she said, it is too beef stew. She got real, you know, her, her boy's not telling her what beef stew is. It is too. I said, Mom, it is not. I said, look at the can. I said, here's a, that's a golden retriever <laughs> on the can. <laughs> Just pointed that little hint out, you know, and at that point, my mother started laughing. I'll never forget that. She just started laughing, and she said, well, she said, I don't care. It tastes good. <laughs> And in answer to your question, no, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't taste it, okay? But so, so during that time, it was a weird time in our lives because we were celebrating a momentous event in our ministry, and we were also mourning the loss of, of my mother. So what was, a, what was surreal and strange was over the course of that time, I would receive cards in the mail. And I brought a box of cards. I brought my, I call this my stack of cards. I brought these tonight just as a, an illustration. And I'd go to the mailbox every day and, and there'd be three or four cards. And this happened over the period of, of several weeks. And I remember opening them and some were um, cards like this. A card that says, your ministry is making a difference. And, and many, many cards, scores of cards from church people. Another one, congratulations. I'd open each envelope. I didn't know what it was. Thanking God for you today. Congratulations, you're a blessing. Celebrating 25 years of service at Faith Baptist Church. This person made their own card. That's classy. I love this card. It's easy to feel thankful for amazing people like you. I love that. And every day I'd go open cards, but then interspersed with these cards that were great joy were cards like this with prayers and heartfelt sympathy. I didn't know what card I was going to open when I opened the envelopes, or a card like this, with sympathy in the loss of your mother, with love and sympathy. And they were all interspersed together. And as I would open those cards day after day, probably for a period of about two weeks, I remember thinking this is so much how life is. We have periods of great joy and celebration where everything seems to be going well. And then we'll have a period of darkness or tragedy or sorrow. And God has designed life that both of those things are an integral part of our human experience. The thing I love about the Bible is this. The Bible is very raw in its honesty. You turn to Psalm 77, and I want to read just a few verses. And I'm going to make some observations tonight. I love this because God, the Holy Spirit, did not inspire a lofty ideal to which I cannot relate, but God, the Holy Spirit, used human penmen to write words that I have felt in my own life. The, the Bible is an epic book. It's an epic book because these are human emotions that turn our hearts back to God. Look at Psalm 77, please, verse number 1. The Bible says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. Say, God always hears. Now, sometimes it seems like he doesn't. In a moment, I'm going to read some verses that if I were writing the Bible, perhaps I wouldn't have put them in the Bible. They're so honest. But the psalmist Asaph, in this case, who was a great musician under King David, Asaph gives us this psalm in its raw reality. He says this in verse 2, 
In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night, likely a physical condition David had, and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was comforted. Does it say that? No, no, no. See, this is why, this is why, you know the Bible is God's word because it's honest. Because it's honest. Whatever the psalmist was going through, and we don't know exactly what that was, but whatever the psalmist was going through here, he says, I remembered God and was troubled. Now note the next two words. I complained. Something we're told never to do. Now, anyone who's a habitual complainer, that's certainly not correct. But there are times when a complaint is legitimate. Take a concordance sometime, or your phone concordance, look it up, and find out how many times the Bible, the psalmists say, these were good men, spiritual men, who walked with God, and yet they say they had a complaint about life. Do you know why that is? Because it's real. Well, uh, Pastor Monty, but, you know, I should be better than that. I suppose we all should be better than that. But aren't you thankful for a book that meets us where we live? Aren't you thankful that God didn't set up some kind of high and lofty perfectionism that would discourage us? I'm thankful for that. Have you ever been there where you complained to the Lord? I think if you've been a Christian any length of time and gone through any deep waters, if you're honest, perhaps you have. I know I have. I know I have. Lord, why is this happening? Lord, what is that all about? Lord, this particular circumstance does not fit what I had planned. It's not part of my vision. It's not part of my future. And yet all of a sudden it crashes in and it becomes just that. He says, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. How many know? Razor, we're just family here tonight. Have you ever been overwhelmed? Oh, I can tell you I have. I have been overwhelmed. I've passed my year. You're Pastor Monty, the pastor of Faith Baptist Church in Danville, Indiana, growing, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, talk about that all you want. I have been overwhelmed. I've told our, our church has grown by over 250 people in the last two years. Okay, I, uh, yeah, you, someone said amen. I say, oh, me. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not so sure. I, I'm, I get overwhelmed. It's very easy to get overwhelmed with one's circumstances. The psalmist felt the same way. He said, I was overwhelmed. And then he said, verse number four, speaking of God, he said, thou holdest mine eyes waking. In other words, I can't sleep. Have you ever been so troubled that you can't sleep? I have. Lost many, many a night. He says, I'm so troubled. uh, Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I'm so troubled. Then he says, I cannot speak. So there's no words to express the trouble in my heart. This psalm is classified as what's called a psalm of lament. Lament. Lament is kind of a word that means mourning, but it is more than that. Lament in the Bible, and you could do a study on this. I'll not do that tonight, but you could do a study. Lament in the Bible deals with the process of sorrow and the process of loss. I say the word process very specifically because there are an awful lot of Christian people that think that somehow we can go through a great loss and we should just snap out of it if we're spiritual. Now look at me, everyone. The Bible never teaches that. In fact, fully one-third of the Psalms are classified as lament Psalms where the psalmist pens the words under the divine inspiration of the Spirit of God while his heart is breaking and the tears are flowing. It is the real and true and genuine human emotion that is expressed to us from the Psalms as the psalmist is in the process or on the journey of lament. And a journey of lament that is biblical ultimately ends in healing, but it is never instantaneous. I think we do despite to the scripture when we promise people an instantaneous correction. You you go to the, the home of someone who's lost a close loved one. I don't know how many young preachers have said this to me. Pastor Monty, you know, I've I've got to go visit someone and and a loved one has passed away. Uh, What do I say? What do I say to make it all better? And the answer is there's nothing you say to make it all better. And by the way, this fact of human nature is known all the way from ancient times. The most ancient book of the Bible is the book of Job. 
And the Bible tells us that Job's three friends, now his friends had some kind of wonky ideas as we get in the book of Job. We understand that, okay? But you know what his three friends did? They came to Job in the midst of his loss, and out of respect for that, they sat for days in silence. Can I tell you something, give you a little secret? It's not the words that you speak to someone in loss. It is your physical presence that makes the difference. Nothing you can say will ease that pain instantaneously. And by the way, we shouldn't even try. Because as we're going to learn from the Psalms, the process of lament or of sorrow is a process that is important for us to go to. There's no such thing as a quick fix, but Psalm 77 gives us a guide for processing through our dark times. And really, we must learn to follow the steps of this. And I'm going to quickly tonight give you the steps from this psalm. And if, you're, if you, you ought to write it down. Someone ought to write this down, just or in your Bible or something. Because when you go through a dark time, you need to go through some specific steps. How many have heard of the book, The Five Stages of Grief? Ever heard of that book? Okay, several hands go up. I think there's value to that book, but I like these stages better. They come right out of the pages of Scripture. Okay, so number one. Here's what I want you to notice. Number one. What is the first step? The psalmist does this in verse number one. Step one in your grief, turn to God. Turn to God. Now, when you read the psalm, the psalmist makes a complaint. The psalmist, in a sense, almost accuses God. God, you, you've kept me awake at night. God, I'm so troubled. I, I can't even speak. God, <laughs> and, and he almost uses words that almost make it sound like he's saying, God, somehow you've turned against me. And in the depths of our soul sometimes, when we go through a dark time, we might feel that God has somehow turned against us. But what I love is this, verse number one, the psalmist says this, I cried unto God with my voice. So in the midst of his doubt and confusion, and frankly, the psalm is filled with human frustration. In the midst of all that, the psalmist turned to the right place. He turned to God. He directed his complaint respectfully toward God. And the whole fact that he turned and complained to God indicated something fundamental. He believed in God in spite of his circumstances. Let me repeat that. He believed in God in spite of his circumstances. Voicing a complaint to God is legitimate. Pastor Monty, prove it. How many of you have ever heard of the book of Lamentations? One of the most neglected books and beautiful poetic books in all of Scripture, penned by the hand of the prophet Jeremiah under divine inspiration where Jeremiah mourns the loss of everything he had. When the Babylonians came into Jerusalem, he was there to witness the destruction, the carnage, the savagery of that invasion. He was there to watch as family after family, friend after friend, was carried away captive. He was there to watch as the beautiful temple of God was destroyed. And he laments the loss of everything he had, and then he looks to God. Ladies and gentlemen, God is the only thing that will never change in your life. Amen. We need to understand that. See, well, oh, Pastor Money, you know, um, if I work hard enough, all my investments are one day going to pay off and it's going to be smooth sailing. Not necessarily. Do you ever find that our expectations are sometimes dashed on the, hopes of, uh, on the rocks of reality? Sure. In fact, for us to put great faith in all of the things that we rely on so heavily means that when they are gone, we will hurt all the more. And I think one of the stories, the, the, the applications of the book of Lamentations is this. Sometimes God strips away everything on the external so that we look at him once again. I love this. The psalmist turned to God. Relief and answers, the restored joy, that's not immediate. Verses 2 through 4 explain that. There's, there's no such thing as a quick fix. Sorrow is a process. It is a journey. And healing always takes time. But the very first step is to turn toward God, not to turn away from Him. It is a very shallow faith that turns away from God. Right. Pastor Monty, you know, I'm, I'm just very frustrated with God. Okay, but at least you still believe in Him. At least you still believe. Well, Pastor, Pastor Ronnie, I don't know why God allowed this. At least you still believe. 
One of the worst things a person can do is make himself the center of the universe and declare that because I'm going through a hard time, God no longer exists. That's one of the worst things a person can do because to do that, to abandon the God of the Bible, is to abandon all hope. We need to learn to hold on to things a little more loosely. When my mom was slipping away from us, a lot of questions. You know, I, 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 can I share something? Some of you are going to think I'm unspiritual. I don't care. As my mom was slipping away and got to the point where she couldn't recognize us anymore. By the way, one of the blessings was Alzheimer's patients in that stage, they settle on an emotion. They'll settle, they choose an emotion, not consciously, it just happens, I guess. And my mother settled on the emotion of joy. And all the people at the nursing home said she's our favorite that we've ever had. Said she's always joyful. She really was. She, and give her a cookie, and that doubled the joy. She, she was just a happy, and that, that, that helped us. But as she slipped away and got to the point where we didn't know her anymore, I, I wondered, Lord, why is she still here? So for a long time I thought, well, she's here so she could pray and be a prayer warrior. And, but she couldn't pray anymore. One of our assistant pastors, and understand she was in Alzheimer's, one of our assistant pastors went to visit her and to pray with her, and he prayed with her, and I think she decided in her mind that he was a Jehovah's Witness. I don't know. Because <laughs> she let him have it. <laughs> she told him to get away from her. So he came back rather crestfallen. I said, well, you know, she's got Alzheimer's. You know, The next time she was perfect as a peach. You know how it goes. But... Um, I wondered why God kept her. And there were very many times, many, many times, when I prayed that the Lord would take her home. Because I didn't understand. I was frustrated with it. I didn't understand. Many times I said, Lord, God, could you just take her home? One time I prayed this. I said, I said, Lord, I said, her heavenly mansion may not be quite ready, but I'm sure it's livable. <laughs> I know, pretty shallow prayer, right? <laughs> okay. Um, but turning to God. Not away from him, but to him, even when we don't understand. Number two, quickly, look at verse number five. Verse number five. The psalmist says this in the midst of his trouble. He says, I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. Now, now think about this. He's thinking. He's considering. Verse number six, he's remembering. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune. That's meditation in one's heart. I commune with mine own heart. My spirit, the inside of me, made diligent search. What is the next step? The next step, first I turn to God. Secondly, I think and reflect. I think and reflect. God allows really heart-wrenching times to come to make us look deeply. What did the psalmist think about? He thought about past experiences in verse number five, both, both good and bad. Consider the fact that everyone suffers in their life, that life is largely made up of suffering. But I can't forget about the good. And so it's very easy for us to get into what I call the tunnel vision of suffering. When you're in a crisis and when your heart is breaking, it seems like everything that was so wide open and sunny all of a sudden narrows to a very, very dark tunnel. You can't see anything good to the right, nothing good to the left, nothing good up, nothing good down. And you say, Pastor, where's the light at the end of the tunnel? For some of us, when we're in the middle of it, there's no light there whatsoever. We get this tunnel vision. The psalmist says you need to think beyond that. That's very human, very natural. The psalmist says you need to think beyond that. Remember that God is good. When things are bad, remember that God is good. And, and sometimes it's good to just write out a list of all of the goodness of God and how you've seen God work in your past. He talks about verse number six, the previous comforts. He said, I considered the days of old and the years of ancient times. He remembered grace through former sorrows. He did a diligent, introspective search. Um, he asked himself, perhaps, what got me through the last time I faced great sorrow? Certainly, he asked himself, how did the Lord deliver? And once you have a little history of that in your life, you can kind of put things in perspective a bit and say, it looks incredibly bleak now. It looks impossible now. But there's a God who's going to deliver. It's really good sometimes to think and reflect. A number three I want to give you. It's okay to ask some hard questions. Okay? 
So you're going to turn to God, you're going to think and reflect. And then number three, you're going to ask some hard questions. Look at verse number seven. The psalmist asks some really odd questions because he goes now from his personal trial to a broader sense, perhaps for the people of Israel. He says, will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Have you ever thought about those questions? Those are really hard questions. In fact, honestly, it kind of surprises me they're in the Bible, right? I mean, let's just be honest. This, you know, he's, he's sounding kind of like uh, questioning God here. It's okay to ask hard questions, listen carefully, as long as you're asking God. And as long as you ask them in the right way. In verse 7, he essentially asks, is God ignoring me? That's a question about faith. But he doesn't ask the question, does God exist? Do you see the difference? He assumes the existence of God. His question is an honorable question. In verse 7, he says, where is God's goodness? He doesn't say, is God good? See, there are a lot of people that want to impugn the character of God when they go through a personal trial. What the psalmist said is this, I, I just want to see God's goodness in my life. And isn't that real human? Isn't that what we all want, to see God's goodness in our life? Absolutely we do. The psalmist is asking the right questions. He's asking them in the right way. Verse number eight, he says, is God, does God still love me? Does God still love me? Sometimes we go through something and we wonder, well, where's the love of God? But he doesn't ask this. He doesn't ask, is God loving? How many unbelievers will say, well, Pastor Monty, a loving God would not allow this, this, and this? That's a question of God's character. Not one time does the psalmist impugn the character of God. He asks the question in verse number 8, will God keep his promises? Are his promises still for me? But he doesn't ask, is God untrustworthy? See, that impugns the character. He says, maybe God keeps his promises to everyone else, but maybe somehow I'm an exception, or maybe I've gone beyond his promises. He questions verse number nine, where is God's grace? But he doesn't question the graciousness of God. Does everybody see where we're going with this? These are legitimate, real questions, but he never impugns God. What about God's mercy, he asks in verse number nine, but he doesn't ask the question, is God himself merciful? So the right questions never impugn, they never accuse the character of God. Circumstances in our lives create feelings and emotions, and our feelings may feel true. But sometimes they're just not based on truth. What I love about the psalmist is he never questioned who God is. He questioned why. I might suggest to you, too, that we all want to answer the question, why? Don't we want, I've got so many questions. I hope there's a Q&A. Pastor Johnson, you do Q&As here, don't I hope there's Q&A up in heaven. It's been the first 10 million years doing that. I got a lot of questions questions why, but you know, really, in reality, in this life, that's not always the best question to ask yourself. So you may never find the answer to the reason why, and even if you find the answer to the reason why, it doesn't change the circumstances, and sometimes if you find the answer to the reason why for a given set of circumstances, it can be more painful than not knowing. A better question to ask yourself is the question, what? What do I do now. What does God have for me now? now? Now, don't rush that answer because you have a grieving process. You have a process of lament to get to, but what does God want for me now? Hard questions always lead back to truth when they are asked in faith. So, we're going to turn to God. We're going to think and reflect. We're going to ask some hard questions, and then we're going to focus on some truth. Look at verse number, uh, verse number 10, please, with me, if you will. He said this, Psalm 77, verse 10, And I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of God. What is the truth? That God will always deliver. He will always deliver. Oh, but, but, but Pastor Monty, I, I, uh, I know someone who was terminally ill. We prayed for them to be healed, and they died. Maybe God's deliverance is through death. Because to be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, we, we can't, we're not Pentecostals. 
Okay, these faith healers. You ever watch them on TV? There was a guy, I think his name, how many remember Peter Popov? Do you remember Peter? Okay, okay, a couple hands. You know, Peter was getting old like all the rest of us are getting old. But boy, Peter dyed his hair. It was jet black. And I'm absolutely convinced the last, it's been decades, the last time I saw him on TV, I'm sure it was a wig. Because <laughs> he couldn't get old. He's a faith healer. We don't believe in that. Did you know what we do believe in? It is appointed unto men once to die. We all have an appointment we're going to, to keep. Sometimes God chooses to deliver through the channel of death. And by the way, for the believer, that, that's, that's stepping out of a deeply flawed and broken body into the presence of the Lord. Brother Hamilton, your daddy's in heaven. He is not only singing in the angel choir, he is leading the angel choir. <laughs> and he's making sure right now that it's the right style of music. I guarantee <laughs> he's... he's <laughs> if there's any of them bad angels snuck in there, he's whipping them into shape. But you watch, you watch your dad. And, and the downwards, you know exactly what I'm talking about. He stepped out of this life of brokenness into a life of glory. Amen. And the Bible tells me this, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. If I could go there and come back, I couldn't even describe it to you. It'd be so amazing. Right. Our God always delivers. He always does that. And, and God is good all the time. So sometimes I don't see that. How many of you ever had your parents discipline you when you were a kid? I hope so. I sure hope. Pastor Ward, get your hand in the air. Okay. My daddy used a belt. Fastest belt in the West. And every time I got the belt, by the way, it didn't happen too many times because the belt cured that. Okay. Fear of the belt. If you spend money, that sounds abusive. No, it was well deserved on every occasion. Every time I got the belt, I got that anger. So a good young man, a little anger wells up. By the way, if dad saw that anger, <laughs> the belt, whoo, more, okay, until there was submission. But you know what? When I was a kid, I didn't appreciate it. I didn't like it one bit. My dad was, he wasn't a Christian, but he had some very, he was World War II veteran. He had some really interesting disciplinary uh, ways about him. I remember one time I was a little kid, probably <clears throat> seven, six, seven years old. I was at the dinner table. My mother fixed pork chops. <clears throat> and... Um, my mother was a good cook, but not with pork chops. She, she would fry them and overdo it, and they were like leather. They were super chewy and hard to eat, you know, and, and, uh, and I just didn't like it. You know, I just had my, my childhood teeth, you know what I'm saying, or whatever. They were falling out in the plate. And so my mother fixed these pork chops, I was dreading it, and uh, she put one on my plate. My dad was sitting right across from me, and I said, I don't want that. Boy, now there was a look on my dad's face, that flash came to dad's eyes. He was Italian. That flash came to his eyes. And I said, I, I'm, not, I'm not eating that. And I decided I would stand my ground. I'm not eating that. I don't want that. I don't want it. And my mother, such an angel, she's like, well, what would you like? Boy, I could, my dad was seething. My mother was, I said, I want, a, oh, I want an open-faced peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You know, just one piece of bread. Open-faced. My mother got up from the table. She shouldn't have done this. But she got up from the table. She made this open-faced peanut butter and jelly sandwich. She set it down in front of me, and I had won the battle with my dad. My dad was seething. He wasn't saying a word. Boy, when an Italian gets quiet, <laughs> trouble's a-brewing. I remember I looked at that, and I looked at my dad and smiled. My dad reached across that table that fast, picked up the whole thing, and slammed it in my face, <laughs> and smeared it around, okay? Now, now, you say, Pastor Money, that just sounds horrible. It's one of my best memories. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because my dad, in doing that, was being good to me. I needed that to learn. You ever thought about this? God is good all the time. I'm just going to focus on truth, and I'm going to trust God and embrace his redemption. Quick, that's number five. I'll be done in a second. Where is that? Look at verse number 14. So interesting in this psalm. 
Thou art the God, the psalmist said, that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine hand redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw thee, O God, the waters saw thee. They were afraid the depths were troubled. What, what is this talking about? It's a reference to the Exodus. And the Exodus is the great redemptive story of the Old Testament. And the psalmist is saying, in the midst of the ruin, in the midst of the tragedy, in the midst of the tears, in the midst of the heartache, in the midst of the loss, the psalmist is saying, I can rise above this and somehow with tears in my eyes and a broken heart, I can embrace the redemption of God. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a good pathway. Now, one sermon doesn't fix the broken heart, period. But I'll tell you what the psalm gives us. It gives us a pathway. Turn to God. Think and reflect. Ask some hard questions. Focus on truth and embrace redemption. Pastor Monty, when is it going to get better? I don't know. But I can tell you this. If you do these things, you're on a pathway that will lead you out of darkness and again into the light. Amen. And so... The mailbox of your life, you've opened a sympathy card, and it's sad. But you walk through this process, and one day you'll get to that mailbox again, and you'll open another card sent from God, and it will be something good, and it will be something joyous, and where tears have fallen, maybe for many, many days, eventually the light will begin to shine. And that is why the scripture says, sorrow endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Father, I pray you'll take our message tonight and help someone. Help us, Lord, to understand that lament, biblical true lament is a process. And help us, Lord, to accept that and then to follow the pathway of the psalmist. Thank you for giving us truth in the Bible to which every one of us can relate. And now I pray, Spirit of God, you'll work in every heart. We ask it in Jesus' name.